little friend the you know easel cam are set up and ready to go. This is a razor for a lot of fun. It's a really, really helpful. Um, it goes on, it goes on, and we have a great time. So let's say we have a great time right now. And I'm not having fun right now. Because there's a whole bunch of stuff right up in front of me right now. And, ah, there it is. No! I don't want you. <laughs> Hello and welcome once again. Here we are at Jason Robert LeClaire's uh, Draw and Paint Club. I'm a couple minutes earlier than I thought I would be. Um, brought to you by CartoonsAndCreatures.com. Um, you know, which is my website, please visit the website. Please subscribe if you have not to what we are doing here. What we are doing here today, what are we doing? We are going to go ahead and finish this painting. That's right. We are going to be working once again on this particular painting today, creating... Um, now we are going to work with straight acrylic, we are going to be going with, um, if I can get that a little bit further over, there we go. We're going to be working with full out acrylic, but we are going to be using this time around, uh, I used some basic acrylics the last time, and this time I'm going to go full out, full tilt, and we are going to have some fun with um, my regular acrylics that I use for my fine art. Coloration is the same, so you don't have to worry about the coloration being different. Um, it's just the quality of the pigment is higher, so it's gonna be a little bit uh, more rich as I'm playing around working, and it's a little bit easier to kind of like uh, handle and maneuver and play with on this end of things. So I am going to start uh, top left, and we're going to move all over the place as we go along, almost like we did when we started, but I think what we need to do this time is I really kind of have to fill in some of that backdrop. So I'm going to grab my Burnt Umber for my first color today, and I'm going to grab my uh, Phthalo Blue. because that is going to set me up with the proper amount of um, kind of like blackish or really dark sort of set of stuff here. Um, we kind of like started with a little bit of a wash of that the other day and it worked out really, really well. But today, again, we are going to start using, um, you know, stuff pretty much straight out of tube, a little bit different. Um, and I'm working in this area and over here in the darker areas that are in between the leaves and whatnot. I'm going to be playing around in there. So, like I said, this is straight out of tube, but it's a lot thicker than what you would be using uh, out of a like student commercial tube. So this is a heavy body acrylic. And I've got a couple of options here. I can water it down or I can use artist's acrylic medium. And the artist's acrylic medium is basically, let me show you what this is. This is a matte medium. So I feel like I, I feel like a beauty commercial sitting here opening up the jar. Um, so what this is, is it's basically clear acrylic and it is not like what we were talking about. It is not a heavy body. It's a very thin body acrylic. So I'm going to grab a little bit of that. So this will actually make the acrylics that I'm using here run and, uh, have the viscosity more like a, uh, 
a student acrylic, but I won't lose a lot of pigmentation with them. And that's what I, what I'm really hoping to do is, is not lose that pigmentation. So this will take on the pigmentation. Um, as you can see, I'm using a palette that is a well-loved palette. And, um, you know, part of that is that I've been utilizing this palette for a very long time. This actually was a prop at one point in a play. Um, so when I did Three Musketeers in 2016, Yes, 2016. Um, the Cardinal was supposed to be painting a self-portrait. And so we went ahead and Cardinal Richelieu, Richelieu um, went ahead and was using my palette. But he, I had left my um, acrylics to dry on it that he was using in his in the portrait and we had a student um, that was exceptional with portraits, uh, Mr. T.J. Bergeron um, from Beacon Charter High School, who was just an amazing um, realist painter uh, and went on to earn his art degree at uh, BU. And I think he's actually got an art teaching degree, um, if I'm not mistaken. But he was he was pursuing that anyway, and uh, really really fine young man, and he made that portrait for us. And the the young gentleman playing Richelieu was uh, Michael Pion. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Jean Michel uh, Pion, and uh, he was you know an absolutely excellent actor. It was a pleasure to work with him. So as you can see, we get a lot darker here. But it's not black. And that's the important part here is that it's not black. I'm not playing with a black. I'm gonna put a little bit of water in it. Just to water it down some. Um, and this tonight is a lot kind of more calm and slower than what we were doing two weeks ago. I hope everybody had a really nice weekend last weekend. I did miss you. Um, hey, hi, Gladys. How are you today? So nice to see you. Um, you know, I had a nice weekend with family, which was great. I mean, we do have to make sure that we put that sort of thing together, have some time with family and really, you know, especially now when we are, you know, coming and getting through this pandemic. It's very nice to see you. Gladys, who is uh, messaging me right now, who's watching along with us, uh, is an exceptional children's theater director and uh, storyteller, etc. And I had the pleasure of working with her on, I, uh, for my part, it was a small project for hers, it was large. Um, Oscar Wilde's The Selfish Giant for last Easter, uh, which was fantastic and came up in my Facebook memories and I was elated to see it. Um, that was one of my favorite set of drawings to make. And so thank you, Gladys, for providing that um, the ability to do that. It was wonderful, remarkable experience. Wish I had had time to do more than just three. Oh, at some point, perhaps. Some point, perhaps. Right now, so I'm just filling in these dark darks that we have back there. And we're kind of really, really sinking them in behind. And you can see, I'm looking at the video, what you guys are seeing, and um, it's really sinking it back quite far without making it black. That's a really, really important factor here. 
it's actually a super dark green. And the reason why that's so important is because we are doing this forest scene. We don't want to make it, um, you want to make it black. If we make it black, it will flatten the entire picture, which at times is useful. For this, not really what we're going for, you know? So again, the combination is theta saline blue, and this is a theta saline blue that has a green hue to it. Most of the time when you're buying a student kit or a standard commercial kit, it just says, it just says theta saline blue. The thing about theta saline is that you get, can you tell I really like saying the word theta saline? Um, they come in two different hues. You've got green hue and blue hue. And so if I were using a theta saline blue that had a blue hue in it, then this would look much more blue as I, as I were making it. Um, whereas it has this slight tinge of green to it as I'm working, which is great for my purposes here. And oddly enough, the theta saline green that I have has a blue hue, just because I like, you know, confusing myself as I go forward. What I'm listening to tonight is the soundtrack to Wolf Walkers, um, a film that was on Netflix recently by the same folks that did Song of the Sea and The Secret of Kells, one of my favorite animation teams. Um, and they work in conjunction with uh, the Irish government and uh, one of the, I think Belgium. Um, and they're their storytelling is just so rich and so wonderful. And the way that they do it, it really does look like living book illustration, which I can certainly appreciate. Um, I have a lot of fun watching those films. They very much speak to me and They're just lovely. My apologies again for being a little late this evening. I did have some um, last minute business to attend to. Something came up that um, someone needed my help, so I had to go and do that, which is not a had to, but a, a you know, a, I, um, I don't know how to put it. I was being a responsible human being. There I said it. I actually can be responsible if I want someone else. Nobody thinks that usually. I think I want to stick with the instrumentals. Not that I don't like that lovely voice, but we're sticking with instrumentals tonight. I don't even know how much of that you guys can hear. So what I'm doing is, um, as I sit here and I, you know, create these dark patches, I'm also taking the round brush and I'm just daubing. Not Dobby, we're not in Harry Potter land right now. Um, I'm daubing, D-A-U. B-I-N-G, and daubing, you know, is just kind of like, it's almost like stippling. But, oh, Stefania, hi, how you doing? No, I'm painting with acrylics this evening. I had done some acrylic washes a couple of weeks ago on this piece, and now I am working with uh, acrylics again, but I'm working with more straight acrylic than I had with the washes that I was doing. And the acrylics that I'm using are uh, pro-grade acrylics, artist-grade acrylics um, this time around, instead of the student grade that I did with the washes. Um, so a lot more pigmentation, and I added a little bit of matte medium. So that's kind of like really 
giving it a lot of depth as I go through. Um, because I can add layer after layer after layer. And so thank you all of you that have uh, joined in. I'm looking at about 65 people that have uh, been viewing. If you have not subscribed to me yet on whatever platform that you are looking at this on, whether it be Facebook, Twitch, um, Haps TV, which is where this is originating from, or YouTube, uh, please subscribe if you like what we're doing here, um, if it seems intriguing to you. Uh, a lot more of these lessons, I think, are going to end up being over multiple sessions. So the good part about that is if you miss one, it's okay. They all get recorded uh, onto the Facebook and whatnot. Lower grade acrylics and pro acrylics. Yes, I do, actually. Um, personally, go for the cheaper stuff. Having given the nice paint a shot. Okay. Um, what are you missing out on? You're missing out on a, a, a massive pigmentation difference. And uh, it's not like I can afford all the time to like grab golden paints and whatnot, but even the the brand name, I'm sorry, like the ge generics that you get at like uh, Blick or at one of the, the stores that specializes in, you know, fine art equipment, like instead of Michael's, Michael's is great. Um, and they have pro grade acrylics, they have golden, they have, you know, they have their own brands, etc. that are, are more professional grade, but they're far more expensive. And I find their own brand um, a little bit not as not as good. It's, again, a matter of like, personal preference. You know, I, I work with a little bit of everything. So when I'm working on really large scale stuff, like the mural that uh, is in my Instagram right now and my Facebook, uh, a lot, most of that is house paint and paint marker. Um, you know, because it's huge, it's 10 foot by four foot. Uh, and it's not affordable for me to do that because there's not as much detail in that particular piece as opposed to the piece that I just did for the same company that is their Instagram wall outside of their new facility in Providence. Um, I used the same paint I'm using today um, because it's an up close and personal. It's not, uh, the other one's 10 feet up in the air. This one people are to stand in front of and you know take their Instagram shots. So. Uh, again, pigmentation and color fastness is a big part of it too. As a professional grade will last a lot longer color fast wise. It's also a matter of like how thick it is. If, if you're doing something where you need a heavy body acrylic, it's hard to find a, a decent heavy body acrylic that's got good pigmentation in a student grade. I hope that answers your question, Stefania. So, I mean, I would I would grab one tube and and play around with it. I first thing I would do is grab like one of the yeah, grab one of the grab one of the like what they call a series one, um, <clears throat> something that's a common color like. Um, you know, grab a titanium white. It's going to be the cheapest of those expensive brands. And with the amount of white we usually use when we're making something, um, it's, it's worth it to have that as a really good, solid pigmented base, you know? So I, that would be my recommendation. If you wanted to see what it's like, go with, go with the white first and then build it up, build up your collection from there. Like whenever I can, whenever I have a commission and I can go ahead and justify <laughs> splurging for the big stuff, um, 
I, I do. I, I'll, I'll, I'll grab a tube of it. Um, it also lasts longer. That's the other thing. Um, the heavier and more rich the pigment, the last or the tube, the, the longer the tube lasts you. So it's kind of a trade-off. You know, I only need very little to get the job done for a large scale piece. Um, I just finished a piece that was, like I said, uh, it's the Instagram wall for that, uh, for a coffee shop. And it was 22 inches by six and a half feet. And I did not use, believe it or not, that much paint. Like if I were using um, student grade, I probably would have used a cup, like a full tube of a couple of the colors I used. Whereas the sky took up, I don't know, maybe a, a quarter size dollop of the blue and, um, you know, maybe a couple of tablespoons of white along with some, a little bit of the medium I put in. So it's like, you know, that, that's a huge advantage when you don't have to use as much material to get the job done, you know, and you still end up with a really, really nice end product. So as you can see, I'm kind of, I'm, now I'm going back into, into washes with this darker color. Um, another trick, by the way, for those of you that, that do, you know, want to keep pursuing into painting and whatnot is uh, plastic wrap is your friend. So very often when I'm working on an acrylic, I, I don't do the whole thing at one shot. And so I plastic wrap my palettes. And I'm really bad about palettes. I'm kind of OCD about my palettes. So I usually work with like four palettes at a shot. And I'll have a different colorway on each palette. Like that's my warm palette, that's my cool palette, that's my green palette, that's my black and white palette. Um, so I've got, you know, all these palettes moving <laughs> all over the place and I have to keep switching between them. Uh, so I do use a lot of plastic wrap and um, when I'm kind of juggling in between. Now I do want this to be a little bit more abstract, not abstracted, but I don't want this to be necessarily be like super realism. That's not the goal here for me. My, I'm, I'm trying to make something that is you know, I still like the painterly conceit. You know, I still, I still want to admit that I'm using paint. You know, I don't want to uh, go ahead and do super realism. I have no problem with super realism. I think it's fascinating and wonderful. I personally would be way too frustrated with it. I'd want to break out all the tools in my arsenal to make sure it was super realistic. Like I'd have my airbrush out and all of the glazes I could possibly find and all the inks and whatnot. It's just really, really involved and it's not my thing at this point, especially when I'm trying to relax and paint with friends online. Um, that's not relaxing for me. And I have a particular style of painting that I, I like to think people that's the reason people hire me is because they like how I paint. Hi, Michelle. I'm doing fantastic. I'm, I'm running late today, but I'm doing fantastic. Had some, uh, some stuff to take care of, uh, that ended up being, you know, last minute, but here I am and I'm having a very good time. Uh, we were just talking about the difference between um, higher end pro acrylics and, um, you know, just student grade or mass commercial acrylic. Oh, you're in the middle of dinner. Oh, okay. What are we having? I got to ask. You, you tell me that you're in dinner. I got to ask what you're having.
So I'm going to really sink some deep darks into here. Oh, the creamy, yeah, definitely. Uh, and it depends on what body you buy. I mean, I, I usually go for the heavy body so that I can water it down um, if I need to, but I can also get a really nice heavy body. Hang on. Sage, oh my gosh, that sounds so good. Sage and mushroom meatloaf. Ugh. So a meatless meatloaf made with sage and mushroom or a meated meatloaf made with sage and mushroom. One has to be specific sometimes, I find. Ooh, mac and cheese. My wife makes amazing mac and cheese. Okay, so meat along with those two. Oh, that sounds delicious. So laying in the... Getting, getting back to actually like why I'm here tonight. Um, one of the things about uh, what I'm doing right now is laying in the backdrop is so super important because it's the foundation that you can build on top of. And if you're working with acrylics, it's a lot different than working with watercolor, obviously. Um, but the biggest difference that you're going to find is that with the acrylic, oh, what are you doing? Excuse me. No, thank you. Um, with the acrylic, you can paint over it. And it doesn't, like we talked about the last time, if any of you were here the last time, um, that's kind of the advantage, is that you're, you're able to go ahead and maneuver things over other things. Versus... In watercolor, if you try to go over what you just did, yeah, it's going to reconstitute the watercolor, and it's going to be all over the place, and it's going to be frustrating as all get out, and I get very frustrated very easily, so I don't like that. I love working with watercolor, but there's a whole different set of rules for watercolor than there are for acrylics, and I like acrylics rules in this particular case because I know that I'm going to be all over the place with this. And the one thing I forgot today is paper towel. Ooh, hey, this will work. Something next. That works. Gouache. I, I have a love-hate relationship with gouache. Um... And perhaps just because I haven't used it enough. I find it unwieldy. Um, I love putting it on top of watercolor as like highlights or deep shadow, but by itself, I never found it as fun. My mother loves working with gouache and she's phenomenal at it. I am not so phenomenal at it. Um, again, it's a matter of like, I haven't practiced enough with it. Yeah, I'm impatient. <laughs> I'm not very good when it comes to taking my time with stuff. Although I do find that I, I, I take my time, oddly enough, with large-scale acrylics. Um, again, I was, I was just talking about a piece. If you go on my Instagram, you can see it. Uh, in process anyway. I, the final piece, I'm going to wait until I hang it and install it to put it up on Insta. Um, just because I think out of context, it's not as not as cool as in context. But I followed the advice of my friend, Harley Bartlett. Um, yeah, charcoal and graphite is a lot of fun. I'm, I haven't used charcoal and graphite um, like pure graphite and pure charcoal uh, for anything but sketching since I was in college uh, and in college I was still fighting with things had to be controllable um, so I still in that kind of like high school sort of thought pattern of I don't want to use paint because it goes everywhere 
and not like realizing that's kind of what it's supposed to do. So that's why you use it. Um, so yeah, there was that. So again, right now I'm just playing with the dark darks. Um, and I will be maneuvering into some of the lights and everything. But look at the difference in this versus what we started with. Um, you know, just popping those darks in just pulls all of this stuff out and really gives us that richness and makes things like this in the drawing start to really, you know, pop out and, and come to life a little bit and give us some sort of definition from, I'm not the drawing, the, uh, the reference photograph. Now, you might notice that I'm not sticking very well to the reference photograph. Yeah, I'm good like that. I don't. I don't stick to reference photographs. I use them as a guideline. Unless it's very specific and like it's a commission and somebody says, I want you to draw my dog. Okay, no problem. I'll stick to the reference photograph. But for my own personal work, the reference photographs are, again, I'm not super realism here. I use the reference photograph as kind of like the beginning of the stage for this. And I'm, I'm very strict about where I get my reference photographs. Um, the vast majority of the time, they're mine. I take tons of photos whenever I'm in anywhere that I think those things that I'm seeing at the time could be eventually useful. And I put them in, you know, a digital album of reference photos. So that's kind of what uh, I do when I'm doing that. All righty, let's see where are we at here. Okay, there we go. Um, I was I keep thinking about what on earth next week is going to be because I like to think ahead and plan ahead and tell you guys what's coming. Um, next week, I'm thinking that I would really like to do um, Thank you, Ray. Wicked smart. Um, I'd love to I'd love to kind of go ahead and take some of my old work out. I just scanned about 170 pages of my old sketchbooks and I'd love to like break out some old material and try to redo it. Knowing what I know now and do it in like an acrylic or in a watercolor. Because most of the stuff that's in my sketchbooks is black and white. So I think maybe that's what we'll do next week is if you ha if you have a sketchbook that you use or an old drawing or painting that you've done and you'd like to redo it, next week would be the time. Um, if you do not, you are more than welcome to whatever it is that I am doing out of my sketchbooks. Um, I'd love to see your rendition of one of my pieces. I think that'd be fun. I think I have to do something drastic here that I wasn't planning on doing, but I'm going to have to do because it's not panning out the way I want it to. Oh, we're grabbing the dagger brush. <laughs> it sounds so violent when I'm like, I'm painting on it, I gotta grab my dagger. Um, this is a dagger brush. Okay, I need a dagger brush. Let's bring that against the white for you to see has the curved end of it. OK. 
okay, it's really not. A dagger, so to speak. And I'm going to go over all of these so that I can pop up the color again, the highlights and whatnot, and really bring those out. So we're going to put... I'm throwing shade, everybody. I'm throwing shade. I can't tell you how many times my students find it absolutely horrifying when I use one of their terms. One of my favorites is when I get snarky in, in class and uh, they'll be like, oh, Mr. LaGlaire! I'll be like, yep. Um, salter than the ocean, and I got more shade than a lunar eclipse, so back off. That usually gets a good laugh, and we move forward. Okay. Again, this is like, you gotta remember that these, these colors, I haven't done anything here. <laughs> I haven't changed colors yet today. Um, this is theta saline blue, green tint, or green hue, um, and burnt umber. So basically, dark green, blue, and black to make everything happen today so far. Um, because you can do a lot of stuff when you're working with um, these basic things. So, you know, I am right now throwing some washes down. I'm going to take my shadowed areas that I see in the photograph where I've got um, leaves that are far more in shadow, and I am going to take that dagger and I'm going to go right ahead and just kind of develop those areas with a little bit of a shadow, and then I'm going to be moving forward with some lighter tones. Um, and I'm going to move away from my theta saline and everything. I'm going to move toward my next set of colors. And while I do that, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to save this because this is a really good color that I'm going to want to use later. And so what I use is I use like, you know, like the, the condiment cups that you get at a restaurant. I used to love going to Wendy's when I still ate junk food um, and just filling up the condiment cups with ketchup and barbecue sauce and just mm -hmm. all that stuff that I probably shouldn't have been eating so much of, uh, even as a kid with a when I had a metabolism. Um, so I scraped that right off of my thing here and I use a little condiment cup to save that for later. Artistic leftovers. <laughs> kind of gross. Um, but hey, it works. So I'm going to have to go to a different portion of my palette. And we are going to work with some greens at this point. Uh, wait a minute, let's look at the photograph. Yes, green will have to be last because the leaves and whatnot go on top of the trunks. So let's throw those greens down the bottom underneath the picture and let's go for our friends, your friends and mine, the titanium white. Oh, I got it upside down. So uh, Stefania, if you're still watching, golden titanium white. Um, not cheap, but man, I've had this thing for like three years. So it lasted a good long time. Series one. Um, and I'm you know, still kind of like working with this. Golden heavy body is just so amazing. So let's see, what does the tube actually look like? Well, there we go. Okay, so it's about half a tube left. But 
I don't need a lot to make things happen. I'm going to put a daub of white up there. You know, that's going to last me through a lot of this painting. Um, and then I've got the Utrecht Burnt Sienna. Which, mine is quite dried up, unfortunately. Uh, but I do need a little bit of that going. This Burnt Sienna is really, really super red. Um... Something to keep in mind is that like a real burnt sienna is going to be red. It is going to be like rust colored. So you want to be aware of that before you start popping it into things. Um, you're going to get that that kind of reddish tone. So it's it's almost like a brick sort of. Um, it's a good foundation for brick when you're whenever you're painting brick. Um, and again, that's the difference between like a real um, burnt sienna and um, something that's a lesser grade yellow ochre. All my faves, all my faves, hopping out here. And one that I have not used yet with you that is a go-to so many times, Payne's Gray. Da, 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 da. So again, another tube of golden. Yay! Got my hands on another tube of golden. Um, this is a series two, so it's a little bit more expensive. Every series has its own expenses. Um, but Payne's Gray is this really superb gray. Um, by the way, when you're buying um, a really great artist color, if the company's good, what they do is they actually put a sample. They actually take and paint a sample onto the tube to show you the sheen, everything, and they'll put it over black and white stripes so you get an idea of its translucency. Um, I always loved that. It always really was very convenient helping me pick out what paints am I going to use to make certain things happen. You know? Uh, what do we need? What do we need? What do we need? Brush, 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 brush. There are just too many brushes here. Uh, this gives you an idea of, of what goes on when I'm sitting here trying to decide a brush. This is what I'm looking at. This is my acrylic brush roll. So I amass a lot of brushes as I go along, and they all have different purposes and all have different things for me to do with them. So I'm trying to do the trunks of the trees right now and give them some, a little bit of brown, a little bit of gray to kind of like work that in. Um, so I'm gonna grab my quarter inch flat brush to start me off today. And I think what I'm gonna do is I'm, I'm going to use one of my palette knives to do my mixing. Um, so let's get some different music on here. I can't believe I ran out of music. Ah. Always happens. Always run out of music. Okay, let's try some steampunk hip hop instrumental. Don't ask. reddish tone from that burnt sienna, and again, that burnt sienna is very, very stiff and dry. Looks like I gave another two burnt sienna. Do that next time I go to the store. Very, very little of that, and we're going to do mostly Of that burnt umber. Darken that up some. Let's 
I need more burnt umber too. Now I gotta say that I have been using these particular paints for some of them for a couple of years. So that accounts for some of them being a little bit aged, but it also is remarkable how much I get out of a single tube. So one of the perplexing things about doing trees is that trees are not, I repeat, are not strictly brown. Gasp! No, they're not brown. They have a lot of gray in them. Uh, one thing that I do, by the way, is I, I kind of like scrape off my palette knives because there's a lot of excess on the palette knife, particularly when I'm working on a small scale piece. I need whatever I can get. Oh yeah, it's it's a very interesting mix. It's it's called chap hop, um, and uh, one of my favorite chap hop artists is uh, Professor Elemental. So the gentleman that that does a lot of his background music released um, an album of all the background music and uh, backing vocals, etc., that Elemental uses when he's doing his stuff. So when I'm when I'm talking and painting, I like to have instrumental in the background, but otherwise I do listen to a lot of lyrical stuff. And Professor Elemental stuff is just hysterical most of the time, so I spend a lot of time laughing. I guess what I appreciate about a lot of steampunk stuff is that steampunks make up um, stories and worlds that go along with whatever it is that they're making. You know, so there's a large amount of storytelling within the genre. I mean, it was a literary genre to start with, so um, it does, it's not shocking that there's a lot of storytelling. Got a little tech glitch there. Sorry guys, it looked like my uh, my charger was not plugged in properly. Still isn't.
Oof. There we are. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, there's a little bit of a power glitch. My uh, So here we go. We're back. And we're back on task. There we are. Uh, I'm keep monitoring that power. I usually don't look at it, but thank you for those of you that stuck around. Um, I super appreciate it. And uh, we're going to keep on going here. So as I was saying, um, before I was so rudely interrupted by power issues, um, trees don't generally have just brown to them. They really have a lot of gray. In this case, the gray has a little touch of brown to it. So I'm going to go ahead and mix up something like so. that it goes and compositionally re recurs um, in different spaces. One of the things that I would probably do is I go ahead and I have that kind of like recur in the rocks. Now what I'm doing is I'm just taking a little bit of water and just kind of like doing a quick brush through of just watering it down a little bit, turning it into kind of a little bit of a wash, just to give it a little bit less keep going on there. So if we look at the picture. Highlights happening. I'm going to grab my round brush again. I'm kind of live mixing wet on wet works very well. Um, when you want to get things to look more organic and gradient toned, and I think that's, um, you know, one of those things that I really enjoy doing. Because it, I, I love things that look purposely organic. This stuff is very organic. And again, even though I I I like to have an element of reality in what I'm doing, perhaps it's the illustrator in me. <laughs> I allow myself a lot of leverage to alter the reality that I am painting. Um, 
but I do I do frequently tell my students, you know, nobody else is, has has your your reference photo in front of them. So how you interpret it is you know, is your thing. It's how you are perceiving that. Now that being said, it still has to have some sort of logical maneuverability to it. It still has to have you know light sources falling where they need to fall. Um, you can't really just kind of like flub it the whole way and go, yeah, but that's how it was. Um, because if it doesn't make sense that it could possibly be like that in the physical world, it's, it's not going to, you're not going to sell it. Sorry. Not going to work. One of the things about, one of the things about like really successful, like sci-fi illustration, for instance, is that and it's fantasy illustration is that it looks like it could, like it's plausible, you know, like that, that, that could be a reality. Even, even if it's totally ludicrous, like there's no way to believe that that's, that's actual. If it's done right, it looks real enough to spark the imagination and make things feel like they're possible. Necessarily like get anything on here too terribly like finished. I, I kind of like having a little bit of an impressionistic. where, you know, letting the paint do its thing becomes important. I want it to puddle, I want it to pool, I want it to create different textures in here.
again, for any of the, the folks that are uh, watching and enjoying this, um, I am on YouTube, I, wherever you're watching it from, rather, um, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, uh, or here on Haps. Please subscribe if you're enjoying what you're seeing. Uh, there is certain to be more as we go forward. So I would love to have you subscribe and uh, keep following along as this artistic adventure expands. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you so much for subscribing. That's very, very nice of you. Welcome aboard. So where is everybody tuning in from? I'm always curious on this one. This helps me figure out, you know, where y'all are at. Some of you already know. Um, but for those of you that uh, maybe are new to the broadcast, would love to know where people are watching from tonight. Or this morning, depending on where you are. See, if you're going to go to Haps TV, there's just a little button that tells me that you can just throw up there and it says, hello from blank, wherever you're from. Oh. And I'm easy to find on Haps. It's haps.tv slash Jason Robert LeClerc. Everything I do is slash Jason Robert LeClerc. For the most part. We've also got cartoons and creatures running around, which is where I store all my stuff. That's my portfolio site. So if you want to check out the rest of what I do, the best places to find that are Instagram and on my website, cartoonsandcreatures.com. All right, I think our trees are in a really good place now for me to start doing some leaf work without interrupting too much of the trunk. Uh, yeah, looks good. So we're gonna get some greens down here on the palette. Greens that we're using are a little bit of phthalo green. That's gonna be our dark green. Our emerald green is going to be our middle base. And then in order to create different versions of the emerald green, so we get different types of leaves, we are going to put in some Hansa yellow or some cadmium yellow medium. Uh, cadmium yellow comes in medium and light generally are the easiest to find. Uh, I like the medium because I already have the Hansa and this is more like a lemon than yellow. Um, so that would be kind of the equivalent if you were looking for what yellow to use. Um, and, and so when it comes to this, I would usually use the kind of the darker colors first. So I'm gonna grab a little bit of cadmium. I'm so glad I'm wearing like painting clothes right now because I just dropped the cadmium on my lap. Nothing came out, thankfully, but still dropped the cadmium on my lap. Oh, and do be careful of cadmiums. Uh, the element cadmium in, cadmium red, cadmium orange, cad well, anything that says cadmium, they make it with and without actual cadmium. Um, if you're using a pro brand, 
they'll make it with or without. If you're using a non-pro brand, more than likely it doesn't have a lot of cadmium in it. Why is that a problem, Jay? Well, it's easy. Cadmium's toxic. Uh, when you have too much exposure to it, it's a bad thing. So we want to make sure that nobody here has too much exposure to cadmium. Not the most preferable thing in the world. So I'm going to grab some of the phthalo and I'm going to grab some of the emerald to kind of tune the tone the phthalo down a little bit and it makes this really beautiful bright green but even that has to get a little toned down with a little yellow what i love about this picture is that it is july 4th in this picture and it is super sunny and just like really an absolutely lovely day in this picture and it was a great trip um, to Roger Williams Park with the camera and myself and my child just going around, taking pictures, exploring the park, just having a good time in general. I didn't think I was going to make it either. <laughs> I had to delay the start for an hour. So you, you came in just right because, like, my normal hour and a half is still got a half hour into it. Um, I might end up going a little bit longer today depending on how long it takes me to get through the leaves on this. Um, having a pretty good time doing them. Just started the green as you can see by the first layer, layer of wash going down here. Um, so we're using a phthalo green, an emerald green, and a little tiny bit of cadmium medium yellow. The thing about heavy body um, paints, because we're talking about like you know pro paints versus um, non-pro paints, is if I don't water it down, like this is this is full body paint. I can block out what's underneath it. And so that's another advantage of a professional quality paint is that it's going to be richer and you're going to be able to like water it down and do what you need to do with it that way or you are going to be able to utilize it as a thick media that's going to go ahead and cover over it. You got to remember that acrylic is just liquid plastic really honestly that's that's all it is um and it's the alternative to like i mean acrylics became a thing when people were looking for an alternative to oil that was quicker drying um oil definitely has its place i really do when i have the opportunity and time i do like working in oils um i don't usually have a lot of time to do it because they do take so long to dry that what happens is i don't have a lot of spaces in 
my studio slash home to leave it to dry. Um, and I use I use water water cleanup oils, which is a relatively new thing. Um, you know what? That's a good idea. I have a friend that was well, acquaintance rather, um, in college that was completely colorblind, and he used to take the labels off of his paints. I think I probably told that story at one point. Um, and taking the labels off of his paints would allow him just to paint by tone, which is all he could see anyway. So he came up with some of the most amazing looking landscapes and whatnot based on just tone. Very often they were a little bit weird, um, like not pleasant weird. Um, but more often than not, they were just absolutely lovely. So he used that uh, particular court to his advantage. So speaking of that, when, when looking at something like this, you know, again, I'm looking at, at tone I'm going to build up things with shadow and light in order to, you know, create the tones that I need. It just so happens that these tones also have a color attached to them. Right now, I'm pretty far off of the color that's in the photo. I am going to be building layers. Music makes me feel like I'm at a carnival or something. That's a good teacher. That is a good teacher right there. Paint with whatever color you want. As opposed to, you know, telling somebody that they're wrong, especially if they have no control over a physical perception. It's like my grandfather Leclerc was ambidextrous. Why was he ambidextrous? Because when he was young and he was growing up, he was a lefty and had his knuckles wrapped quite a few times. Enough that, you know, he had to figure out how to do everything with his right hand. And in so doing, he became fully ambidextrous. At least that's what I'm told. <laughs> I don't know if you're seeing that in my painting right now, Molly, but that's okay. Um, because this is this particular tree had some brilliant colors in it. Brilliant color. Um, and this is about where I start to tone down a little bit. So I am going to grab that um, Hansa green. I mean Hansa yellow, which is more the lemon yellow. And uh, I'm actually going to even grab some of the white because I want it to kind of pop. So I'm going to start with a little bit of the emerald green, quite a bit of the Hansa. 
makes this really bright kind of lime look to it. And then I'm going to grab some white. And now I've got something that's more toward the tone of some of these leaves we're seeing in this next layer of leaves as we go up. Not quite a mint, but has that general feel to it. And if I take a little yellow and plop that right in there with it, it does make give it that little bit of brightness. Oh, wow. Thank you, Ray. And Molly, that's a really interesting story. That That's kind of like most, uh, most lefties in, um, in that particular generation had that, that same kind of issue. That was the perception. A lot of people, that, that's exactly why my grandfather ended up being ambidextrous and why he ended up getting chastised for being a lefty. And it wasn't just like relegated to like religious schools either. I mean, it was like just like a general perception in you know the Judeo-Christian climate that was that era. You know, public or private schools have the same kind of rolling policy on that. It's funny how things change because now we look at the left-handed person and I'm like, oh, you should be, you, you must be really creative. It's like, and yeah, a lot of creatives are lefties. And if you think about it now, like how many creative people in history were actually lefties, but had it kind of like, you know, worked out of them. I'm, I'm being very kind by saying worked out of them. And again, while I'm making these leaves, by the way, it's really, um, tapping. I'm, I'm kind of like stippling the whole time. Um, and I'm stippling with a quarter inch flat brush. For those of you that didn't catch that, I had to come in late, etc. And what that does is it allows me to kind of like have the, have the, the, the it's weird because they're not actually leaves in the photo. It's more like um, needles, like an evergreen. Um, so it's just, it's kind of this odd combo where I definitely want to get across, you know, this field of beautiful greenery, but I also need to make sure that it looks relatively like what it's supposed to. Because I am I'm working mostly in impressionism here. You know, that, that painterly conceit that I, I'm using paint. Here, look at me, I'm using paint. Um, I don't want to hide the fact that I'm using paint. That, um, you know, it's kind of a re revelation for me very late in my career was to just accept the fact that if you're using paint, admit that it's paint, and just make things look like they're paint. Instead of fighting it and trying to make them look like they're real. Super realists, God love them. Go right ahead. Have a blast, guys. Not my thing. Gonna paint. I'm gonna go ahead and just admit that I'm painting. I'm time to fight it.
Yeah, so you had similar circumstance, Molly, to a lot of people um, of probably your aunts and uncles' generation. Which is unfortunate, but... Okay. We're getting there. We're getting there. I bet 80 people have been viewing this tonight, so that's good. This is actually kind of better than the last time we were out here, which is fun. I think it's fun. This music is so fun. I just need to have fun sometimes. And the music be fun. Music has to be fun. If it's not fun, I get bored easy. If you hadn't noticed. Um, if you hadn't noticed, you're not paying attention. does not take much to distract me. Squirrel! Just kidding. There are no squirrels in my house. That I know of. Although, my younger beagle, at one point, one summer, we received a call from uh, kids that were home. And I guess he had figured out and found a juvenile possum and brought it into the house. And at first, of course, you know, you have this, this creature coming in in the mouth of a dog that's not moving. You figure it's dead. Well, no, it was. And I know this is silly. It was actually a possum playing possum. So, the thing got downstairs because he ran in and ran right down to the basement before I had a door on the basement. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. There it was. They are big figures. Big figures, Ray. And Ray, you actually know the dog. Bailey was the one that did that. Because, you know, he's just... He's just Bailey. I think they've moved on, but there was a, a amount of time where um, just recently we had some rabbits that decided to move in underneath my deck, and Bailey was having a field day. Not that he got to them. Because prevented that from happening, but he was definitely after them big time. He would not leave that deck. And I think that um, the mother was was giving birth to them, etc., and, and had, had a nest where she was, you know, birthing her young, and he could smell them, so he was going crazy trying to get to them. Uh, and I believe she's moved them now because he's not at that section of the backyard anymore, which is a blessing and a half because 
he's onto something. He's a beagle. He's onto something. That's it. No stopping. Ooh, I'm out of weight. So we're almost done with the top section of this, believe it or not. Detail, and once you know, and this is kind of part of it. Like, if you're doing washes as your base, once you get to the top, uh, or the top layers rather, it's a lot easier to establish the colors and the buildup of the material to get the effects that you want. Because you've got that really nice, like, light base of wash to work on top of. I find. Which is kind of why I wanted to do this particular piece that way, because I think it's a valuable tool and skill to learn when you're trying to figure out acrylics. Is to be able to, you know, mess and muck around with hop down the bottom. So the bottom has a lot of kind of like washes in it. And those washes are a lot of the colors that we've been using up top just kind of toned down. Um, so a little bit more kind of pastel sort of look. Whoops. I'm knocking over everything today. It is. I've got so much equipment out. When I'm doing acrylic, it's nuts how much stuff I have out with. Now, here's an oddity for you. It's not really an oddity. I mean, it's just a, just a little bit of um, how colors work. So a little color theory for you. I just threw down neon green, and it is not the color that's in the painting. In the, in the photo. It is certainly not. It makes it look like a toxic waste dump. So, I need to make the color that it actually is. Well, the thing about pastels that's interesting is, you know, a lot of people look at like a light green or a light pink or a light blue, um, you know, with just the whites in them as a pastel. This that I'm using right now, this is a pastel green. How is it pastel? It's pastel because not only do I have the white in that, I have a little bit of gray. And that's the difference between a pastel and a light. Is lightning in color has just the white in it. A pastel will have the gray in it. Pastel is that the pastel has that gray. Mm -hmm. 
So putting the undertone of the neon really gave me some good light source there. And then I can build upon that, you know, with, again, the white and gray in things. And create a lot of different kind of like colorations. just decided to come back on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hi. Good to see you. Um, there's a couple of raised structures, like raised plant life in here. There's um, like lily pads and stuff. So I think we're going to bring those up a little bit. Um, just so that we have a little variation and a little break in the horizon line, because it can be a, considered a horizon line right there. Okay. And we are nearly done. Let me grab my round brush. And one of the things that I'm going to put in that's not necessarily in there, but I think is um, kind of an important piece to a pond like this are the lilies, water lilies. we are going to use and make some same like um kind of combination of neon and pastel it really pads a little bit of uh, break up there and the lily pads which, by the way, do not have to be, like, that's the thing about when you're doing something, like, even slightly expressionistically, um, these do not have to be perfect shapes by any means. Um, you know, it's, try to explain impressionism to, um, to kids and... The easiest way I can say to describe it is um, because the concept itself is, especially when you're discussing someone like Monet, is a little bit of a, a, a mind leap. It's a little bit of a, a meta sort of thing to do is to imagine only painting the light and not the object upon which the light is hitting. Um, just that concept alone is like, what are you talking about? Um, and it takes a while to understand and, and really grasp. So for for younger kids, it's, it's not that easy. So what I usually say is, you're just trying to give an impression of it. It's not the thing. It's an impression of the thing. 
um, you know, breaking it down that way. So these are impressions of water lilies, not necessarily water lilies. If I wanted to get hyper detailed, I wanted to do, you know, um, do that, I could. I really don't feel the need to. Just a little yellow stamen right there. And you know what? I, th I think I like it as is. I think this is this is where I, I want to finish it tonight. Um, curiously enough, it's 8.34, which means that we've been at this for an hour and 34 minutes, which is perfect. Considering I normally do stuff for about an hour and a half. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ramp up, wrap up with um, loading up my signature brush with a light, light green. Viscous so that it travels nice and fast. Thank you once again for joining me on Jason's Draw and Paint Club. Um, we are finished with this particular painting of a one of my photographs from July 4th uh, walking through Roger Williams Memorial Park in Providence Rhode Island at their uh, Zen Japanese gardens so thank you thank you so much for joining me this weekend next weekend we will break out some older work uh, and kind of take a peek at that I think what I might be doing is gasp, venturing into some oils. I have an oil painting that has been on the easel for a year and a half, wanting desperately to be finished. It is a space landscape, like a space fantasy landscape, and I'm teaching space fantasy again this year, this summer in the youth classes at RISD, and so it seems to me that that is the perfect time to go ahead and finish that particular painting would be this week upcoming so that I can, you know, have a new thing to play with in illustrating space fantasy. Thank you so much for joining me. I will see you next week, and as per normal, stay safe, stay healthy, and make art.